thanks all for coming. So this is the lovely Jo Duckworth, who we first showed here in 2010, what, 11? Um, you graduated in 2010, didn't you? Yes, so 2011, um, we had Jo in our annual Emerging Art Show Exploration, which is in its 15th year now, and we thought her work was so gorgeous, we signed her on. And then she showed with us in 2012, your first solo, and sold out, which is we were all very excited about, weren't we? <laughs> She has just been going like great guns, and we are all really looking forward to hearing a bit of her um, information about how she comes up with this beautiful work. So, thank you, Major. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming, venturing out on this chilly afternoon. That's really great. Um, painting for me was never a conscious decision, it was just something that was always there. That's um, something that I love to do. Both my grandmothers painted, and as a young girl I was surrounded by beautiful large landscape paintings in heavy gilt or gold frames that seemed to take up every inch of wall space on their, on their walls in their home. I have early memories of my grandmother and myself as a little girl um, painting magpies outside with my grandmother's beautiful watercolour set. Um, she encouraged them to sit for us with leftover breakfast toast. So some lovely, lovely, very early memories. So painting is something that's always just been good for me. My work these days sits somewhere between abstraction and representation, but I have no desire to make them topographical. My work is all about relationships. But in saying that, the landscape that surrounds me plays a large part of what my work is about. I depend on what I see around me. And these are the slides that Grace has got going beautifully for me, thank you. This is a river that, um, that is, that as we drive home from Albury, we see each day. I live in, um, I spend a lot of time in the landscape. I have to do something like this. <laughs> oh, the river, oh, yeah, that's right. And these are the hills that, um, practice quite often, but anyway, <laughs> often it. These are um, the river before, and these are the hills, um, that's the back hill behind our home. Uh, this is Tabletop Mountain, which is an iconic um, <coughs> landmark. Everybody knows Tabletop, and uh, you'll see it creeping into some of my, um, some of my works. Uh, the mountains that surround me, I love the mountains. We often um, head up that way. My garden in springtime, lots of hot pink, um, a summer garden, uh, and a winter, uh, an autumn. We have these amazing pink skies at night come over us, and uh, I, love, um, I love the pink skies and beautiful colours. And we've had Jack Frost visiting us in the last <laughs> couple of months, freezing cold mornings in the morning. We often get up, it's a view outside my bedroom window, sort of fly, you never know what the day is because it's quite cold in my house. We, we pull the curtain shut and the blinds down so when Ken gets up and the window goes up, it's always a surprise of what the day is going to be. And, and um, as you can see, Jack Frost has really been out there. Then we get these amazing skies that roll over that back hill. That's our backyard um, and another that's from our front yard. But lovely, lovely, amazing coloured skies come over. So I spend a lot of time looking and being in the landscape. I live in an amazing part of the world, downstream from Albury in an area called Splitters Creek, um, which is situated on the Murray River and we live very close to what is called Wonga wetlands. The wetlands are a floodplain of the Murray River. They're an ecosystem of lagoons and billabongs covering about 80 hectares, and the wetlands are a haven for wildlife, especially birds. There are miles of walking tracks throughout, and this is the origin of, of many of my works. The Murray River plays an enormous part of life in Auburn. And as a teenager, I would spend many afternoons 
after school and weekends, swimming and hanging out with my friends at Norial Park. And our daughter, Grace, has had a similar experience. I walk most mornings down the river with my mate, Archie. Um, but what connects me most to the river is the act of walking along, alongside it, going with the flow. The river feeds me ideas and it opens my mind to all sorts of possibilities. Possibilities that wouldn't occur to me unless I was there experiencing them firsthand. The relationship between me and the river and the relationship between the river and the surrounding landscape and the elements that affect it, the wind and the rain and the sun and the breeze on the water surface, the way the light plays on the surface, silver luminosities, glistening lights, bright strings of pearls, the reflection of the sky in the water, leaden shadows that provide little windows that you can see beneath the surface, the trace of birds scurrying across the river surface, and fish rising from below make a ripple effect. The way in which the willows break the surface tension of the water, these are all things that I notice and store away. However, you need a sense of something about nature, of landscape as a form of insight, not just sight. There is an innocent in first observations. <clears throat> I was told by a dear old friend of mine, Merv Moriarty, that you have to sit longer. You have to gaze for long enough for you to recognise the landscape and for the landscape to recognise you in return. <coughs> this makes perfect sense to me now. When Claire asked me um, to do this presentation, she said that it was going to be easy to just take a few photos of your studio, where you live and what you paint. So dutifully, I grabbed my camera and went out to all my favourite haunts. Um, it wasn't until I started putting this PowerPoint presentation together that I realised just how alike many of these paintings are. I rarely paint from photos. I rely on my memory and the felt experience because this is what my work is about. Sometimes I draw, but these drawings are more about figuring out what I'm looking at rather than recording it topographically. The drawing is about searching for possibilities. I then come back into my studio and I try to pull a painting out of that. I usually work on about four or five paintings at any one time. And most, um, most weeks I've spend about six days in my studio. The techniques I use to prepare my canvases are very important to me and form part of my art practice. I decided that when I finished my masters at VCA that I was now going to paint in the traditional way, oil on canvas, building up a trajectory of painting history. I use the best quality Belgian linen I can buy and I have it stretched on large stretcher bars that I prime with a rabbit skin glue. Rabbit skin glue is a traditional method used for centuries for priming canvases. The method involves mixing up rabbit skin glue with, um, with water and heating it in a double boiler, cooling it off in the fridge and then applying a couple of thin layers. And this gives me a really natural, earthy start. My canvases are life-size, large enough for me to physically get in them. For me, it is a physical activity. It becomes a relationship between what I have experienced and how the paint is going to respond to the surface. There is a lot of tipping and pouring and splashing and pooling and knocking over paint and <laughs> slipping and all the rest. Um, I lay the works flat on the floor um, to start and then I stand them up against the wall and then they go back on the floor. It's a sort of like a dance that goes on for many weeks with me trying to keep the works open and in a continual state of flux. The way the painting is constructed 
and the physicality of the work is important. As in nature, water and birds and insects find their own path. There is a residue left behind and there is a building up and a scraping off. There is an element of time created by the layering, a collection of lived experiences that filter into the work. Each layer fusing into the surface and each mark and colour responding to what came before. And many magical things happen at this stage of the work. Images slowly reveal themselves and it is a true collaboration between the paint, the canvas and the artist. Jackson Pollock said, when I am painting, I'm not aware of what I'm doing. It is only after a get acquainted period that I see what I've been about. I have no fears of making changes, for the painting has a life of its own. Line, line also plays a large part in my work. I have a fascination with Japanese and Chinese calligraphers the power of the mark. Japanese calligraphers will sit for a long time with a loaded brush, just thinking and imagining and conjuring up the strength to make this one amazing mark. And I spend a lot of time in my studio, much more time thinking and looking than what I do painting. Artists that influence me, Caspar David Friedrich is one of my favorite artists born in 1774. And this is probably one of his, fam uh, of his most famous paintings, Monk by the Sea. Friedrich finds new ways to represent the spiritual world through nature. He wants us to understand the relationship to nature and our memories of our confrontation with nature as a way of understanding the spiritual. He says, the artist should not only paint what he sees before him, but he should also paint what he sees in himself, and he encourages a dialogue with nature. Friedrich is an intelligent painter, but at the same time, you can see that he's very passionate about painting. You can just sit back and totally enjoy his works. Um, they are they are both physical and emotional landscapes. It's another one of Friedrich's um, works that I love. Um, he understands the felt experience. And I'm sure many of us over the years, um, when we've seen a beautiful sunset, will grab the camera and, and go outside and, and line up our composition and um, take this photo. And then when we get back inside and look at it, we feel quite underwhelmed by the whole <laughs> experience. And that's because it, it wasn't about the sunset. It was like the sunset and the feelings that came over you. Was, it was all about the enormity of the colour red. It was all about the colour. And not the, the trees and the road leading up and the mountains in the background. The sunset and that feeling that you got of, was all about this amazing red colour. Also, like the way uh, that he tries to tell us something in the clouds. It's like a form of white writing. You've all heard about white noise. And there is um, this lovely idea about white writing. And to me, there seems to be um, a script in those clouds. And of course, he paints epic skies, which I love. Sigmund uh, Polka, a German artist, uh, born in 1941 and died just a few years ago. I'm interested in the way Polk explores and experiments with different materials, especially translucencies. Polk has a fascination in how images tell lies, how they can't be trusted and how images are, more, are much more complex than they first appear to be. The power of his surfaces, <clears throat> the making of illusion out of, art, out of artificial surfaces interests me. And I also like the way that he moves 
really easily between abstraction and figuration. Another influence on my work is the Japanese aesthetics of wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is a Japanese held view centered on acceptance and transience of, of imperfection. It is a beauty found in humble things that are not quite perfect, which are unfinished and random. You can see it everywhere in nature, in a handful of autumn leaves or the rust on an old shed or a broken pot. Wabi-sabi is more profound than these first innocent observations. It is from the soul, a felt experience. It is an understanding that beauty of an object or a person lies in its flaws and its imperfections. There is also an element of time that is infused into wabi-sabi. Painting for me is a felt experience. Some may say my work is all about painting. I love the power of paint and what it can do. So now all the elements of a painting come together. The relationship with the landscape and I, the size of the work, the materiality of the canvas and the paint and the relationship it has with nature, uh, the natural way in which the paint is dripped and poured and pulled on the surface, the substance of the colour and the relationship of simultaneous colour used in the work. The element of time infused in the work created by the layering that allows for the experiences of living and being in the landscape. The influence inferred in the work by the history of painting. The abstract nature of the painting that allows for a layering of meanings and then the addition of a title. And the relationship between the work and the viewer. What happens in this charged space between the viewer and the work? The cognitive uh, versus the spiritual. This is what interests me most. But that's a subject for another time and another day. So I want to thank you all uh, for coming today. And um, in closing, I'd like to thank Louise Martin Chu for the essay that she wrote in the catalogue for the show, and for Claire and Mel and all this, and the staff at Flinders Lane Gallery for all the hard work that goes into putting on a show like this. Thank you.